will actually, a few minutes early in the stage, just so I can go back now, so I can set up. So, um, just as part of a uh, review and just kind of being one more again, you all will recall that we were discussing the structure of viruses, and we said that uh, the, the simplest virus, a named virus, would consist of two basic parts, a protein coat, um, referred to as a capsid. The capsid can come in different shapes, for example, polyhedral shape, helical shape. We'll talk about the so called complex viruses, which have additional um, uh, structures. And then um, the primary function of the protein coat or capsid is to protect the genetic information of the virus. Now, viruses do have nucleic acids as genetic information, but unlike cells, viruses have either DNA as their genetic information or RNA as their genetic information, not both. Now, we will find with viruses, they love to break all our rules, so there are a few exceptions to the either DNA or RNA, but not both. Um, but we will say in general, viruses have either DNA or RNA as their genetic information. And we'll see that the type of genetic information viruses have will influence their potential for rapid mutation. Now, some viruses, um, in addition, may steal some of their host cell membrane and use that as an outermost coat. And that stolen host cell membrane is referred to as a viral envelope. Now, only some viruses have envelopes. Okay, so this is another way we can classify viruses. We can classify them as being enveloped, um, having that stolen host cell membrane on the outside. Or we'll classify them as non-envelope or naked viruses, in which case the protein now, um, just to keep going a little bit on these envelope viruses, this is a, a picture of an envelope virus. Here's the protein um, coat or capsid, and inside is the genetic information. This outermost layer then is stolen host cell membrane, the viral envelope. What's important for us to note is that the virus must modify that stolen host uh, cell membrane before they steal it, and the modification is they have to insert some of their viral proteins. Often these are called glycoproteins, they have little sugar, or carbohydrate groups attached. And one of the most important functions for the insertion of these viral proteins is that the virus must have adhesins in the outermost layer of the virus particle. So adhesins, you guys remember, are um, um, molecules that will bind to complementary molecules on the surface of host cells. This is essential for the first step in viral infection, which is attack the host cells. Now the um, let's see what we got here. Now the significance of these uh, envelope viruses is that anything that damages the viral envelope, and remember that envelope being made of host cell membranes, it's very weak, it's delicate, it has a consistency of like olive oil, so it's easily damaged. Anything that damages the viral envelope makes it impossible for the virus to attach to host cells. Thus, uh, envelope viruses are rapidly inactivated in the environment once they're shed from their host. And that's good news for us. That means we don't need to worry so much about the environment acting as a reservoir for these envelope viruses. One of the few good things that I can that I can describe about HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, is it's an envelope virus. So consequently, we don't worry about it remaining infectious in the environment for a long period of time. Okay, so that's um, again, reflecting historically why it took such a long time for us to, to identify viruses and understand structure is they're so small. So when you talk about average bacteria size around the 1 to 3 micrometer range, when we're talking about viruses, usually the size range of viruses is between 30 and 300 to 400 nanometers. So they're significant smaller than um, bacteria. And consequently, most viruses would require powerful electron microscopes to visualize them. Now, it is true some of the larger viruses belonging to the pox virus family, some of those we might just barely be able to make out with a light microscope. But as a general rule, we're going to state that we have to have a powerful electron microscope to visualize most viruses. Um, just to give you an idea, this is something I always try to keep in mind. Ribosomes, um, ribosomes are around 25 nanometers in size. 
some of the smallest viruses, this is the polio virus, is about the size of a, of a ribosome. So that kind of gives me an idea of the low end of the range. And then some of the larger viruses, as we, um, we're going to talk about the smallpox virus, it belongs to the pox virus family, some of the largest viruses. We might just barely be able to make these guys out with their life microscope at 300 nanometers. Genetic um, information of viruses, as we said, um, usually it's either DNA or RNA. And the um, DNA or RNA, it can be single-stranded, it can be double-stranded, it can have, it can be in a linear form, so strands of, of genetic information. Um, some viruses have multiple strands of genetic information. Um, in some viruses, the genetic information is circular, like a bacterial chromosome. And again, um, reflecting the small size of the viruses and reflecting their requirement to replicate inside a human cell, we would predict that the genetic information they carry is far less than most cellular organisms. So this is just to give us an idea, a bacterial virus, the MS2 bacteriophage, um, is genetic information and codes information for three proteins, so it only has three genes. In contrast, one of the smallest bacteria, one of the smaller bacteria, the chlamydia, um, even though they're some of the smallest bacteria, they still have um, genetic information for a thousand different so we, we see why this lack of genetic information is one reason why viruses must invade cellular organisms and use their biosynthetic machinery to replicate themselves. This is just to give us a visual. This is a um, E. coli that's been lysed. And th all of the spaghetti strands here is the single chromosome of the E. coli. Just phenomenal how it fits into that cell. So all of this is the E. coli chromosomal DNA. And up here is a little bacterial virus uh, genetic information. So we can just see size-wise, the viral genetic information is far, far less than that of even the smallest, one of the smallest bacteria. Viral shapes, uh, again, often determined by the shape of the capsid. So we have helical, uh, helical capsids coding the genetic information, such as the bacterial mosaic virus. The polyhedral, uh, very commonly, um, the most common polyhedral shape we'll see is what's called an icosahedral shape, um, uh, polyhedrals of 20 triangular faces. Um, complex viruses, um, an example we'll talk about are the bacteriophage, bacterial viruses. This represents their capsid or head that protects the genetic information. But then in addition, they have these very elegant tails that will be used to uh, attach to the surface of bacteria and then this portion of, of the tail acts as a hypodermic syringe. It's through this hollow protein tube that the genetic information will be injected into bacteria. We'll see that in just a few minutes. Um, so with uh, the viruses, we will be talking about a few examples of specific um, animal, human, DNA, and RNA viruses. And so I, I understand you want to know what you're responsible for on the exam. So of the viruses we talk about, I would like you to know, are they DNA viruses or RNA viruses? And the second thing I'd like you to know is, with regard to structure, are they naked or envelope viruses? Now this um, table here, we won't be talking about all these viral families, but those of you, for example, we'll talk about the pox virus family, the herpes virus family. We'll talk about the papilloma virus family, are responsible for so-called warts, um, and we will look at the uh, hepatitis B uh, family, the virus family. Um, so you just want to remember these are all DNA virus families. And what I did, I, I just modified this table. If it's a naked virus, I put an N there. Okay, so we'll see that the pox viruses, herpes viruses, and the virus, hepatitis B viruses, they're DNA viruses, they're enveloped. The only DNA virus we'll discuss that lacks an envelope that's naked it will be the papilloma viruses, the so-called work viruses. Um, also, you guys, we just want to count the number of virus families, and you'll see that <coughs> virus family names ends in viridae. So how many DNA virus families do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so seven DNA virus families. In contrast, look at the number of RNA uh, virus families. So, wow, one, two, three, more than twice the number of DNA virus families. And we might 
we might um, think, why is this? Why is there such diversity um, not to RNA viruses? And I would like to propose it's because of the genetic information and the enzymes that copy the viral genetic information. So with DNA viruses, which enzymes would copy the viral DNA? Which enzymes would use DNA as a template to synthesize complementary DNA? Good, DNA polymerase, right? Now, does DNA polymerase proofread for edit? Yes. Yes, it does, right? So it has a relatively low escape rate. And whenever we're talking about escape rates, when we're making um, a nucleic acid, each mistake is considered what? A, a mutation, right? So DNA viruses, since their genetic information is going to be copied using DNA polymerase, which makes very few mistakes, it means that DNA viruses have a relatively low mutation rate. Now in contrast, you guys help me out. What about RNA viruses? Which enzymes are going to copy RNA? Which enzymes synthesize RNA? You, you got it. Excellent. Okay, so RNA polymerases. And what do we know about the proofreading ability of RNA polymerases? There's no proofreading, right? Okay, so no proofreading. So what impact does that have on the mistake rate? High mutation high, rate. Yeah, high mistake rate. And what does that mean for the um, potential for mutations of these RNA viruses? High potential for mutation, right? So they have the potential to mutate rapidly. So I'll put potential, potential at high mutation rate. And I'm going to propose that this might help us understand why there's greater diversity amongst the RNA viruses, like we said, you know, 15 RNA virus families compared to 7 DNA virus families. I think, to me, this is probably a reflection of that rapid mutation rate amongst the RNA viruses. And so we just want to always have that kind of on the back burner. We never want to forget that. And likewise, you guys, we're never, I mean, we're just going to hit a few of the, of the RNA virus family. So again, with regard to structure, um, what I'd like you to know is um, you can talk about a specific RNA virus. Know it's an RNA virus and know whether it's naked or on board. All right, so um, what we're going to do then is quickly go through uh, viral replication, one of the earliest models that folks use to study how viruses replicate. And the model was bacteriophage, uh, viruses of bacteria. And the reason, the reason that the first studies were done on these bacteriophages is that there was no ethical or moral um, issues with using um, bacteria to infect it. You know, there was no law to protect the bacteria. And also it's very um, inexpensive. It's, it, these are very relatively inexpensive experiments that can be run in labs. Okay. Um, and again, we just want to remind you guys, one of the problems with viruses, they can only replicate inside a host cell. You can't grow them on non-cellular media like auto you know, in the lab. So this is the problem. Okay, so to understand uh, the basics of bacterial replication, we'll look at bacteriophage. This is a cartoon of um, a group of phages that are called the T-even phages. They're really cool. Um, we see they're considered complex viruses because they have a complex structure. So just so you become familiar, we see here an icosahedral head, um, this capsid made out of capsomeres, and um, the capsid is often referred to as the head of the bacteriophage. Inside, this little squiggle here represents the genetic information. And the T even bacteriophages are DNA viruses. Now here we see this <coughs> elegant tail. Um, the tail is made up of this, this hollow cylinder. This is the hypodermic syringe portion of the bacteriophage. We see a, a base plate and it has these little um, um, hooks or points in it. And also we see these very elegant tail, tail fibers. All of this is made of protein. At the tip of the tail fibers are specific proteins, the adhesins, that are going to bind to very specific molecules on the surface of the bacterium that these guys are going to So what we're um, going to do is just walk through um, one of the replication cycles of these T even bacteriophage. So we'll try to get a little curve. <coughs> so if you look at phage replication, and replication means to make copies. 
there's two fraud replication cycles. One is called the lytic cycle. And it's called the lytic cycle because the host bacteria will always be lysed at the end of this um, uh, replication cycle. So the host bacteria will always be killed. And then we'll look at a second cycle called the lysogenic cycle, in which the host bacteria will not be killed. Now, um, we're going to be talking about two different groups of bacteriophages. We give them names. And so I want to put the names of the bacteriophage groups that carry out the lytic cycle. So these T even phage, which are called lytic phage, carry out the lytic cycle only. And then a second group that we'll um, be introducing here, the temperate bacteria phage. And our example will be the Atlanta bacteria phage. Okay, so both groups of Bacteriophage, the lytic phage and the temperate bacteriophage can carry out this lytic cycle that we're going to explore. So this is a little description of the steps. We're just going to go ahead and um, take this literally one step at a time. So to get you oriented here, this is a, a magnification of the cell wall of our little E. coli host in the cytoplasmic membrane. This would be the inside of the bacterium cytoplasm. So here are a bacteriophage has collided with the bacterium. It's attached using those adhesions on the tip of the tail fibers. So step one of um, viral infection is always attachment. A fancy term for attachment is adsorption. So if a virologist is speaking, they, they often instead of saying attachment, they'll say the virus adsorbed to the cell, attached to the cell. Now, we want to remember, you guys, that if we can somehow block attachment, the virus can't infect the cell. And we're going to see this is going to be an important way that um, our immune system protects us against viral infection. We'll see how antibodies can block attachment of viruses to our cells. So we'll come back to that. Okay, and this is really cool. The virus releases a phage um, enzyme similar to lysozyme. And you guys might remember that lysozyme um, hydrolyzes of glyphosidic bonds and peptoglycan to weaken it. Once the um, lysozyme has been released, this tail sheet it contracts and forces the phage DNA through the tail sheet across <coughs> the cell wall, cell membrane, into the cytoplasm of the bacterium. Okay, so in bacteriophage, the protein portion gets left outside of the cell, the genetic information gets injected into the cell. And then that little bacterium is in trouble. So here we see that phage DNA being introduced into the interior of the cell. <coughs> now this is a complete lytic uh, replication cycle of bacteriophage. The, the handout I gave before um, break has a little picture of this lytic replication cycle, and that's of any help. So we're going to take this step by step. Again, to get oriented, this would be our little E. coli, our host bacterium. The bacterial chromosome is here in purple. Here's our little bacteria phage. The phage DNA is in, I guess we call this what, turquoise color. So we have absorption or attachment. We have injection or entry of the phage DNA into the bacterium. In the lytic cycle, the phage DNA will be transcribed by um, the bacterial <coughs> RNA polymerase to make messenger RNA. And then the mRNA will be translated by the bacterial ribosome. So the bacteria takes, um, takes over biosynthesis of all the phage um, proteins and eventually all the phage DNA. Now some of the phage enzymes that are produced after transcription and translation will hydrolyze the bacterial chromosome. And this is to supply nucleotides so that more copies of the phage DNA are made. Okay, so we see the bacterial chromosome is being degraded here. In the next step called uh, biosynthesis, the poor little E. coli starts making copies of the phage DNA and starts making all the phage proteins required to assemble the, um, uh, the phage capsid and tails. And then, this is the wildest thing you guys, the phage parts are assembled. The proteins come together to make the capsids. And this is wild, you guys. The capsids automatically package themselves with phage DNA. It's, it's an automatic process. It's just the craziest thing. Now, at this point, I just want to take a little sidestep here and um, just 
remind us about one of the examples of horizontal gene transfer. You guys remember it's called transduction, right? Transduction is when bacteriophages transfer DNA from a donor bacterium to a recipient bacterium. It's during this process of assembly that mistakes can be made. And instead of phage DNA being packed <coughs> into, the, uh, into the phage heads, perhaps a little piece of chromosomal DNA from the bacteria will get packaged into the phage head. Now, such a phage is considered a mistake. It's called either a defective phage or a transducing phage. So in the next step here, more of the phage lys uh, lysozyme like enzyme is released, causes weakening of the bacterial cell wall. And now all the newly replicated phage will be released when the poor little bacterium is lysed. And hence, we call this the lytic replication cycle. The host bacterium is always killed. We always have release of multiple newly um, formed bacteriophage. Now again, if we went back to uh, transduction, um, if we had a little transducing phage or defective phage carrying a piece of bacterial chromosomal DNA, that defective phage can still bind to a neighboring bacterium and still inject that bacterial donor DNA. Okay? And if we have homologous recombination, that donor chromosomal DNA can be integrated into the recipient bacterial chromosome. Since um, any piece of the donor chromosome could be transferred, um, this particular type of transduction is called generalized transduction because any piece of donor bacterial DNA can be transferred. Yeah, but if it's transferred to the phage, it's, wasn't the, isn't there um, like, no point because once it goes to the bacteria DNA, it goes to another one and the phage is just going to be affected by that virus. And well, the, if, uh, okay, so in, in generalized transduction, and, and it's too bad because what we want to do is take one of these phages and put a little purple bacterial DNA in here. And generalized transduction, no phage DNA is injected at the recipient. Yeah, it's just the donor of chromosomal DNA. Yeah. So the recipient won't be destroyed since no phage DNA is being injected, only donor bacterial DNA is injected. Yeah, so um, you could argue, well, it doesn't help the phage any, right? Because the that's, that really is an effective phage. You know, it's, it won't be able to cause infection and in replication of bacterium. But it's a powerful force in the evolution of genetic diversity in bacteria. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's the so-called lytic cycle. Um, the result is always the host bacterium is killed. And we always get release of new, uh, newly replicated viruses. Now, the next uh, replication cycle is called the lysogenic cycle. Oh, here's just a really good cartoon of this. Okay, the next uh, type of replication cycle we're going to look at is the lysogenic cycle. And only temperate bacteria pods can carry out the lysogenic cycle. Lytic pods can't. And so the example we're going to use of a temperate bacteriophage is a lambda phage, a lambda bacteriophage of E. coli. Okay, now we'll see in the lysogenic cycle that the first two steps are identical to the lytic cycle. Step one, the absorption or attachment of the phage is the same. Well, again, we'll have special um, um, adhesives that bind to special receptors on the surface of the bacterial cell. We get contraction of the tail sheet that injects the phage DNA into the bacterium. Okay, step two is the same. But what's significantly different is um, what happens after step two. In the lysogenic cycle, there is a phage repressor protein that's made. And the phage repressor protein binds to the operator on the phage DNA, um, the operator that controls expression of the phage genes required for the lytic cycle. So if we have enough phage repressor protein produced early enough, the genes of, of the phage required for the lytic cycle are turned off. They're not transcribed. And that will trigger the phage to enter this lysogenic cycle. Now what happens to the phage DNA? This is so cool. The phage DNA will insert itself, integrate itself into the bacterial chromosome. So this is brand new. We haven't seen this before. 
phage DNA inserted into a bacterial chromosome has a new name. It's called a prophage, like before a phage, right? Now, as far as the E. coli is concerned, as far as the DNA polymerase of E. coli is concerned, that prophage DNA is now part of the bacterial chromosome. And it will be replicated whenever this bacterium is ready to divide. The prophage DNA will be replicated with the rest of the bacterial chromosome. So consequently, that prophage will be passed down generation after generation to all of the descendants of that original bacterium that got infected. So this bacterium is referred to as a lysogen or a lysogenized bacterium. Okay. And what we're seeing here is that generation after generation, that prophage can be copied and passed on to daughter, um, daughter bacterial cells. Yeah, so it's like, oh, that's so cool. So in the lysogenic cycle, we don't get replication of new infectious bacteria phage, but what are we replicating? The phage DNA, right? The phage genetic information is being replicated. Now, remember how we said the lysogenic cycle um, is maintained as long as we have a phage repressor protein present? Okay. So we might ask, well, are there situations in which the phage repressor protein would Destroyed. What will happen then? So we want to we want to answer the first question and say yes, indeed, there are situations in which that phage repressor protein will be destroyed, and when that happens, this is so cool, you guys. The phage will um, undergo what's called induction. It will cut itself out of the chromosome and trigger the lytic cycle. This is wild stuff. Okay, so let's see if we can find Induction. Okay. So um, we want to explore further and say, well, what would cause that destruction of the phage repressor protein? Turns out anything that damages the DNA of the bacterium will trigger a, a kind of an emergency repair process. It's called the SOS response. And there are many new proteins, uh, new enzymes that are produced to help deal with massive DNA repair. And one of those proteins that is produced in this SOS response, it will like accidentally, an un unintended um, uh, process is, one of these enzymes will destroy the phage repressor protein. So if, if you know, guys, I always like to think of a story. So what I like to think about is the prophage is similar to a rat on a ship, and the ship is E. coli, right? And so the phage, our rat, is happy staying on the ship, right? It's getting replicated and all of that. Um, but what happens if the ship hits a huge coral reef and knocks a hole in the ship and the ship is starting to sink? If you were that rat, do you want to go down with the ship or what do you want to do? You want to jump ship, right? You want to get off the ship and maybe find another ship or find land. So that's why I like to think about these these little bacterium phage, they're, the bacterium is like their boat. The phage are like the rats on the boat. Okay. Whenever there's any kind of DNA damage, that might signal this bacterium is going to die. And that phage, that phage DNA will be destroyed if the bacterium is destroyed. So our phage rat then wants to cut itself out of the bacterial chromosome if the bacterium is in the process of dying. Cut itself out of the, uh, the bacterial chromosome and then enter the lytic cycle, okay, so it can make many copies of itself, it can make the, have the bacteria make the, the phage proteins, we'll have assembly and um, formation of the newly replicated phage, and then the phage will be released hopefully before the bacteria dies. Okay, so, um, and again, you guys know I'm a bad biologist because I'm always coming up stories with like how phage are like rats and you coalize like a ship. But to me, it kind of makes survival sense, right? Right? Survival sense, even though we know the phage can't say. So, again, this induction will be triggered anytime there's DNA damage to the E. coli. The resulting repair mechanism, the SOS response, will cause destruction of the phage repressor protein. Okay, that triggers this switch from the lysogenic cycle to the lytic cycle, okay, which, which is described as induction. The, the phage cuts itself out. And we can see that the phage DNA then will be transcribed, the phage mRNA will be translated, we'll get phage protein.
proteins, enzymes produced in chocolate, the bacteria are chromosome. We have biosynthesis of Osh proteins, replication of Osh DNA, we get assembly or packaging, and then lysis. And the whole idea is the phage wants to trigger that lytic cycle before the bacteria actually dies itself. Yeah, pretty wild stuff, right? But again, you know, you're like, oh gosh, you know, we're so tired, we got this lab right, but why is this important? Why do we have to learn this? Well, it turns out, you guys, that um, just as we saw with generalized transduction, this lysogenic lytic combination um, is also involved in horizontal gene transfer. It too is involved in transduction. But the type of transduction that's involved here is called specialized transduction. And we want to describe what we mean by specialized transduction. Okay. When we have induction, when the prophage cuts itself out of the bacterial chromosome, occasionally it'll make a mistake. And instead of cutting right at the junction between phage DNA and bacterial chromosomal DNA, a mistake will be made, and the cut will be made into the bacterial chromosome. So as a result, when the phage leaves the chromosome, it's carrying a little piece of bacterial chromosomal DNA with it. Now that becomes a template for replication of the phage DNA. So all of these phage then would carry not only phage DNA, but a little bit of bacterial chromosomal DNA with them. So all of those phage that would be released in that case, again, they carry some phage DNA and a little bit of donor chromosomal DNA. When they bind and infect an neighbor and E. coli cell, they're going to inject the phage DNA along with that donor chromosomal DNA. And there's two, um, there's two mechanisms by which that donor DNA may survive. If sufficient phage DNA is present, the phage DNA will, uh, can insert into the recipient's chromosome, taking that little piece of chromosomal DNA with it. Or if there's, um, if there's insufficient phage DNA present, the donor chromosomal DNA may get integrated into the recipient's chromosome by homologous recombination. And again, you're probably like, hey, why do we care? Why is this important? Well, it turns out that many of the toxin-producing bacterial pathogens that we'll, some of them we've mentioned already, um, some of them we'll be discussing a little bit later, many of those bacteria have acquired their toxin genes through specialized transduction. So let's just give you a couple of examples here. 